Welcome to my channel where we cover the lore of Final Fantasy XIV. We cover the stories both big and small, the epic and the cute, the silly and the tragic. I hope you all enjoy the ride and welcome to the Chronicler of Lore. Outside of the tribunal in Ishgard, the Warrior of Light comes across a man who's muttering about a heretic who fought like a demon. He took a lot of wounds, but they didn't even slow him down. Darkness poured out of his body and wrapped him up like a shroud, but before he could do whatever he was planning, a Temple Knight impaled him. Rumors are spreading that the man was a Dark Knight, but there's no way to find out since the Temple Knights are dumping the man's corpse in the broom, and it won't be long before all of his possessions are stolen. You being you, you track down the corpse, and when you touch it, darkness envelops you, and a voice speaks into your mind, calling your name and telling you to see. You black out, and when you open your eyes, the man that you thought was dead is standing over you. He introduces himself as Frey, and before you can ask, he lets you know that he's not a heretic, not like the Temple Knights would listen. But he doesn't really care what they think, he's more worried about you. When you touched him, you touched his soul stone, and that could not have been pleasant. You tell him about the voice, but before Frey can question you more about it, someone calls out for help. You go to run off and help, like usual, but Frey blocks your path. Before you run off, he needs to tell you about what's happening to you. Everyone has darkness in them, but the soul crystal allows you to channel it. But if you do it without getting trained, it could end badly, which is why Frey offers to teach you to become a dark knight. Because there's a woman screaming nearby, Frey keeps the explanation short. Dark knights don't care about fame. Their order does what they think is right, be it defending the weak or punishing the guilty. The rules of nations and kings don't mean anything to the knights. They are shields used to hide from justice, and dark knights don't need shields. Since his crystal resonated with you, Frey gives it to you along with his blade so you can use it in your fight for justice. As long as you understand that your new path comes with a cost. Everyone may not be grateful for your work or happy with what you do. But that can't stop you from doling out justice because you hesitating could lead to people suffering. He wants you to think on that while you check on the screaming woman. The screams came from an old woman. She bumped into a temple knight on accident and he'd hit her. Her granddaughter had yelled at the knight, then he dragged her off. He may not kill her, but the memories of what he'll do to her will scar her forever. But Frey has a better idea. The two of you could go and beat them to within an inch of their lives and save the girl. That idea is far more appealing, and Frey assures the old woman that her granddaughter will be safe, and when he's done, the Temple Knights will never bother them again. Frey believes that the Knight took the girl to the Tribunal. He gives you one last piece of advice before you set out. The Knights may threaten to kill the girl if you come closer. If they do, then you have to let them know that you didn't come to save her. You came to kill them. Once they know she's useless as a hostage, they'll either fight or run. As you head to the tribunal, Frey tells you about drawing on the darkness within you to strengthen your body. It's like drawing an ether to do magic, only you use fear, pain, and your other darker emotions. With your combat experience, the new techniques shouldn't be too hard to learn. And you'll need them, because when you find the girl, she's surrounded by temple knights. One of them takes the girl off, while three others attack you. After the beating you give them, they run off, calling for reinforcements. Frey helps you draw out the darkness within, and you cut a path through the nights while Frey shouts out some impressive insults and threats until you reach the girl. Frey shouts to all the remaining knights that if they come after you, he'll come to their homes next. Then you take the girl and leave. The girl's thankful for your help, but neither she nor her grandmother had screamed for help, so she doesn't know what you heard. But whatever called you, she's happy it did, and she's glad you killed those knights. After she leaves, Frey commends you for how fast you caught on, but you have way further to go, and the training will be dangerous. Eh, but you can handle it. In the meantime, Frey thinks it best for you to go your separate ways for a while since you did just attack the Temple Knights, and they'll probably come looking for you. While you're apart, he expects you to get stronger. When things settle down, you meet Frey in the broom where he picks up with your training. First, he explains the voice you heard. All Dark Knights hear a different voice guiding them. The more you draw on your power, the more clear the voice will become. However, your training will be better done somewhere other than Ishgard, so you and Frey head to Little Alamigo. Frey has a ritual called Communion for you to complete, to help you channel your darkness better in battle. 
it's dangerous and it could kill you. So first he wants you to fight something strong and feral so he can see how you handle the battle. You check with one of the locals to find a suitable beast. There's a place called the Red Labyrinth filled with large savage creatures that the trappers in the area avoid. Sounds perfect. And the two of you head out. After you bring down the beast, Frey guides you through the ritual, increasing the darkness within you and causing you to hear the voice again, although it doesn't say anything useful. Still, that's progress. Frey tells you that sometimes the voice comes from someone the Dark Knight is meant to find, which means you could have to travel. Something that doesn't really bother you considering what you do for a living. With that, the ritual is over and it's time to move forward with your training. This time you head to the Burning Wall where Frey has you slay more beasts in what is honestly a pointless display. Frey is admittedly trying to get you to resent him for making you waste your time. He wants those emotions to be strong in you for the next ritual. He begins the ritual but it's interrupted when Isambard, a man you worked with forever ago when you first joined the Signs of the Seventh Dawn, comes asking for help. The Amoja attacked a caravan and abducted some people. He tried to get the Brass Blades and the Immortal Flames to help, but they're too busy to even send a few men. You know what the Amoja will do to people. They will be made into thralls to Ifrit, but Frey thinks it's a stupid idea to charge into an enemy camp to save some idiots who didn't learn to fight before traveling through hostile territory. No matter how stupid it is, you're going to risk your life for them because that's what you do, and Frey knows it. Reluctantly, he agrees to help you save the people. You head to the encampment and the two of you cut a swath through the Amoja. While Frey didn't want to come, as the fighting goes on, he begins to revel in the bloodshed. The two of you free the captives and murder all of the Amoja in the camp. Isambard is happy that you saved the captives, but he seems a bit uncomfortable about how you massacred the Amoja. Frey takes it with a grain of salt. People who have never done battle don't get to judge what the ones they ask to protect them do to their enemies. With the distraction done, Frey continues the ritual, drawing out more of the darkness within you and prompting the voice to come back again. It still babbles nonsense, despite how far your powers have come. Frey thinks that maybe it's because you still don't understand what it means to be a Dark Knight. You consider yourself a hero and you believe you can save everyone. Dark Knights understand that that's only a pipe dream. Sometimes you won't be able to save everyone. Sometimes you'll only be able to save yourself. You can't be a slave to everyone else's burdens, otherwise you won't be able to grow. Your constant desire to solve everyone's problems makes Frey start to question your commitment to your training. The fact that you haven't heard the voice say anything else is proof that you are clinging to your old ways, despite Frey's best attempts to help you improve. As he's chastising you, his knees buckle, but he shrugs it off and decides that he's not giving up on you. He's just going to have to test you more, and the next test will come at the Morabi docks, despite the fact that Frey hates the ocean. He and a friend had a bad experience with a boat and it apparently scarred him for life. His story is interrupted by the sound of someone asking a Maelstrom soldier for help nearby. The soldier is talking to the man when he spots you. He remembers you from when you saved Limsa Lamensa from Leviathan a while back and he wanted to thank you. The traitor who was asking the guard for help decides to beg for yours. He got robbed by some Kikiran bandits nearby which Frey blatantly asks why should he care. Kikiran are hardly worth fighting. As weak as they are, if you get robbed by them, you're not a victim, you're just an idiot. Nevertheless, you are still Mr. Goody Two Shoes and offer to help. Frey is not happy about it, but since you're doing it, you may as well use it for training. He wants you to go wild and let the darkness guide you. The Kikiran don't stand a chance. When you bring the man's cargo back, he has the audacity to complain about how much blood is on the packages. Like you didn't just risk your life for him, for free. He even goes as far as to demand you pay him for his lost goods. Frey loses it, calling the man needy, selfish, and weak. Him and all of the others who always ask you to do things for them that they should be doing for themselves. But then he says something very strange. He says, I should have let you all drown in Leviathan's tidal wave so I wouldn't have to hear your constant whining. Then he runs off. The traitor apologizes, and the soldier, while he understands you being upset, that was a bit harsh. You ignore them and run off after Frey. He hopes you understand what he was telling you before. While the people you have helped did help you grow your dark powers, you don't need them anymore. Doing remedial tasks for fools is a waste of your time. You need to figure out what the voice you've been hearing is trying to tell you and discover your true calling. And you may do better if you leave the land of Eorzea and go where no one knows you. A dark knight cannot be bound to any land. Frey leaves to give you time to think on it. He tells you to go to the gates of judgment and there you can give him your answer. 
At the gates, you call out for him, and the sound of your voice catches the attention of some of the knights who you worked with on your hunt for Shiva. Of course, they're coming to ask you for help. A group of giants have been raiding caravans in the Danafin Pass as they prepare to expand their territory. The knights have been ordered to clear them out, but it's no easy mission, not for the numbers they have. But you are worth a hundred men on your own, so with your help, it'll be easy. Frey hasn't showed up yet, so you agree, and follow the knights as, unbeknownst to you, Frey looks on in disgust. The giants fall easily, with only a few injuries to the knights. The knight claims he's been following your exploits since you first came to Whitebrim, and while your combat skills were always impressive, it was your willingness to help anyone without asking for anything in return that made you his hero. You never worried about someone's station or their race, you just treated everyone like they all mattered. Amidst all the praise, another knight runs up bringing orders from Lord Drummond that you are to come to Whitebrim immediately. You have been accused of a few things after you were seen talking to a corpse in the broom. The accusations are serious. You may be asked to surrender your weapon. When you reach Whitebrim, Frey is standing in the middle of a crowd of fallen soldiers. When he sees you, he laughs at the thought of you surrendering your weapon, mentioning something else that he shouldn't know about. The betrayal in Uldah where you and the Scions had been framed for murder. He knew about Leviathan, claiming he killed the Primal even though he wasn't there. He knew about the betrayal of the Crystal Braves, even though he wasn't there. He has referred to the two of you as we the entire time, and it took all of this for you to finally realize the truth. Frey was dead when you found him. He hasn't been traveling with you. You had taken his sword and soul crystal, but you wanted a teacher who could say the things that you wouldn't. Someone who could yell at the idiots who kept sending you on fetch quests. So you conjured one. There was no Frey. All of the cruel comments he made, all of the savage brutality he committed in combat, that all came from you. The people who were all looking at Frey when he talked weren't seeing him. They were trying to figure out who you were looking at. They thought you were going crazy. But now, the darkness that you fed manifests itself fully, dropping the disguise of Frey and wearing his true face, yours. It attacks you, aiming to take your body for itself. Fighting your darker self is a fight that alone you couldn't hope to win, but Drillmon and some of the other knights join in to help you overcome your darkness. As it dies, it lets you know that while you may have won, your friends have seen the darker side of you, the things that you kept hidden from the others, and there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. They won't look at you the same anymore. However, your friends say otherwise, and you finally accept the darker part of you, absorbing it back into yourself. It lets you know that when you get tired of playing Mr. Nice Guy, It'll be more than happy to take over for you. All you have to do is ask. After the Fight Club-esque incident with Frey and your darker half, Lord Drillmon and the others decide to put the incident behind them since you've done so much for them that you deserve the right to act a little crazy sometimes. One of the Temple Knights decides to dive straight back into his old ways and asks you to come and help him and some allies with yet another problem. However, this knight uses your overly agreeable nature to lead you into an ambush because despite what some of the others think of your good deeds, to some, you're just a heretic who attacked the holy knights. Him and two of his friends try to kill you because despite knowing what you can do, they think they're good enough to take you down. After you kill two of them, the last one still threatens you which, while some people may call that brave, is just dumb. He doesn't even change his tune when the most menacing looking Al-Ra I've ever seen walks up. Because you're kind of dumb yourself, you let the knight run off instead of burying him in the snow like he wanted to do to you. The Ara, a dark knight named Sidergu, questions your intelligence since you followed some men who wanted to kill you then acted surprised when they tried to do it. Something he knows that you didn't learn from Frey. The man was his friend, and he had thought Frey had died until he heard about someone using his sword in battle. So he came to investigate to find out what really happened to his friend and how you learned to fight like him. When you tell him the story, he's not as surprised as you would expect. Apparently, it's not the first time someone channeled a dead Dark Knight who trained them and tried to steal their body. Sid and Frey had trained together, and the man had been incredibly powerful, but that hadn't saved him in the end. He is glad to see that you are carrying on his legacy, and the fact that you learned so much with only his soul crystal to guide you is a testament to how powerful you could become. He has something that he wants to talk to you about later, so he tells you to meet him at the Forgotten Knight in Ishgard. The first thing he tells you is the fact that he met you while you were doing something stupid proves that you have no idea what it means to be a Dark Knight. The very first Dark Knight faced off against the clergy because he didn't agree with their unjust actions, and he sacrificed his home, 
family, and his friends to fight for what he believed was right. And that is what all Dark Knights must do. The common people may hate you, and others may call you a criminal, but it doesn't matter. Even when they hate you or try to kill you, Dark Knights do what's right no matter what. If you're not ready to do that, then Sid wants you to give him your sword and soul crystal and pick up another job, like a botanist or something. The Warrior Light Sword was expensive, so there was no way she would hand it over, and she claims that she's more than willing to do what's necessary to bring about justice. However, her actions have proved otherwise. Sid puts a sword on the table and lets you know that he fixed your mistake of letting the man live who tried to kill you. Mercy is something that is seldom repaid with kindness. The first Ishgardians who met Al Ra thought they were Dravanians. Sid and the others had escaped from the Garlean armies only to be attacked by another nation because they mistook them for dragons. However, the Al Ra could fight, and they fended off the Ishgardians, but instead of killing them all, they let them live. Instead of being grateful for the mercy they were showed, the Ishgardians got reinforcements and came back and began murdering every man, woman, and child they could find. He told you this so you could understand that you have to do what needs to be done because he needs your help with something. When Sid's master died, he told him and Freya Riddle about harnessing the Abyss. They didn't understand what he meant, and they had hoped they would learn the meaning as they grew as Dark Knights. So they continued to fight against all forms of injustice until they came across the Ellison girl who you should have seen standing beside him. Her name is Riel. She was running from a group of Temple Knights who were trying to kill her when Sid and Frey saw her and stepped in. They went into hiding together afterwards, but Frey got caught in the streets when he was grabbing supplies which is when he was killed and you came across his corpse and decided to talk to it because reasons. Sid can't protect Riel alone. He hasn't even figured out why they're after her. But what he does know is that if he dies, they'll kill her. In exchange for finishing your training, Sid wants you to help him protect the girl and possibly figure out what his master's last words meant. Since the warrior of light agrees to help guard the girl, Riel starts to talk to you, although she still doesn't say much. The Temple Knights claim she's an abomination who needs to die for her sins, but she doesn't even know what her sins are, and she nearly bursts into tears when you ask her about her parents. But she does trust Sid, and she wants you to watch his back so he doesn't end up like Frey. Since the introductions are out of the way, it's time to get back to the task at hand of figuring out why the Temple Knights want the girl dead. Sid had overheard some knights talking about some Vanu healers who can see their patient's ether and diagnose illnesses just by looking at you. Riel's not sick, but maybe the Vano can tell you if something strange about her ether that makes the knights want to kill her. You take a trip to Camp Cloudtop where you are forced to collect an offering before the Vano would deal with you. Considering all the time I spent maxing out my reputation with them, you would think they'd let me skip this step, but nope. At least the dance they give you is worth it. With the offering in hand, you give it to the Vano healer who takes a look at Riel's ether, freaks out, and runs away. And of course, some Temple Knights show up to try to kill you. Sid recognizes some of them as members of a group of knights who don't answer to the Lord Commander, as if Amaric would send knights to murder a child. The people probably wouldn't take too kindly to knights murdering a kid in the street, which would explain why they waited until you were out of the city to attack. So other than freaking out Avano and killing a few knights, the trip to Cloudtop was totally worthless. Back in Ishgard, the only thing Sid got from the Vanu healer before she ran off was that a great spirit lies in Riel. That little tidbit gives him the idea to take Riel to some people who are familiar with talking to spirits. That will be the Conjurers of Gridania. Ironically enough, Frey had been skilled in white magic, but that took him months to learn, and it came really easily to Riel. Those particular skills tend to be genetic, so it's possible her ancestors were Conjurers who did something that tainted their ether, and those traits are why the Knights want her dead, but the only way to find out is to head to Gridania. Of course, the knights will be after you as soon as you leave the city, so you're going to need to be careful. Sure enough, a large amount of knights attack you only moments after you leave the city, and they are dead set on burying Riel in the snow. But for some reason, they forgot that you've killed dragons and gods. A few dozen armored men really aren't that much of a challenge. Safely in Gridania, Brother Isumi, the Pajal leader of the Conjurer's Guild who Sid mistakes for a child, is eager to see the girl. As a quick side note, the Pajal aren't a separate race, but they're more like a mutation in some here children. They age slowly and have a natural connection to the forest and the elementals, and even though they have horns, they're not demons. Isumi checks her and he believes that she radiates power similar to someone who drank dragon blood, but otherwise she's totally healthy. 
The idea of Riel being accused of participating in the insane rituals of the heretics angers Sid, and he's even more angry that she didn't speak up for herself. However, at the end in Gradania, she finally tells you some of her story. She had been locked in a windowless prison cell, and while no one claimed she had drank the blood, they did say it was better that she was locked away. Whether she drank dragon blood or not, the fact that her ether shares some Dravanian traits means she'll never be safe in Ishgard. So Sid decides that it may be a good idea to take her to see some Dravanians to determine if she really has ether that resembles theirs. Of course, Dravanians tend to eat people from Ishgard when they see them, since the last time they trusted Ishgardians they were betrayed, had their eyes stolen, and were murdered. However, since you've already made friends with some of the Dravanian leaders, you take them to see Vodafnir with no fear of her trying to chew on any of you. She sends you to take some flowers to a dragon who's dying, and she immediately smells the essence of her dead husband in Riel. His blood flows in her veins, but it's diluted, like she wasn't the one who drank his blood, which is why she hasn't been taken over by it. One of her parents must have done it. And the Temple Knights are well aware of this, which is why they will stop at nothing to kill her. Sid believes that if he could harness the Abyss, he'd have the power to protect her. But the dragon laughs at him, claiming that he understands less than the little creatures that live in the mists around some all about what he seeks. Sid's eager to learn more since the dragon seems to know a bit about what he's trying to do, but she's tired of talking to you now, so it's back to Ishgard you go. Dragon blood or not, Sid gave his word that he'd protect Riel, and he plans on doing it no matter what. Which is a good thing because a priestess named Yastreed, the one who's been sending the knights after Riel, shows up at the Forgotten Night. She tells you that it is the will of the goddess that the abomination be killed, and if you hand her over, the goddess may forgive you. Sid laughs in her face, and Estreed ties another approach. She challenges you all to a trial by combat. If you survive, she'll let Riel live. If you die, then we all know what she'll do to the girl. And if you refuse, she'll burn the hole into the ground and kill everyone inside. If you run away, she'll kill everyone who gives you shelter or even sells you a meal. The woman is insane and Sid is more than willing to stab her now, but she wasn't stupid enough to come alone, and her men might start murdering the other patrons if you attack her, so both of you accept the challenge. Istreed goes to leave, but Riel calls out to her revealing what you probably already guessed. Istreed is her mother. Sid is not happy that it took this long for Riel to let him know that her mother was the reason the knights were after her all along, which considering how Frey died protecting her, that was something that she should have told them. Which he does have a point, but Riel is a child, and having your mother wanting you dead is probably not the easiest thing to talk about. Now that the truth is out, finally you find out the whole story. For generations, the members of Riel's family have given their lives to the church. They usually ended up with very high positions of power, and Estreed was headed in the same direction until her husband was accused of being a heretic. When she confronted him, he drank blood and finished the transformation he had been working on for decades. The Temple Knights killed him, and Estreed had their daughter locked away. His plan was actually a good way to destroy the church. Marry into a family with authority for generations, corrupt yourself with dragon blood slowly so no one notices, have a child who will eventually inherit all of that family's power and be born with dragon blood with no one ever knowing. Now one of the very things they preach against would be their leader, and the fact that they couldn't tell the difference would invalidate all of their teachings. But he failed and now his daughter is being hunted by the Temple Knights. Riel doesn't want either of you to participate in the trial because there's no way her mother will fight fair, but Sid has a plan. When he had mentioned learning to use the Abyss to the dragon, it has said the tiny beings in the mist know a better way to harness true power. If they can teach you, then you should have the power to beat a street and her knights. There's only one group that fit the dragon's description. It's once again time to deal with the most annoying creatures in Eorzea, the Mughals. You head to the Churning Mist and chat with Magi, who has never heard of knights who focused on using the power of darkness. And honestly, he thinks it's a horrible way to live, but he does think he knows why the dragon sent you to him. Sid is not impressed with the Mughals, but Riel is even more fed up with this entire endeavor than he is. She's tired of Sid claiming that he's doing all of this for her benefit when the only thing he really cares about is the Abyss. He's taking her halfway around the world looking for new ways to kill himself, then using her as an excuse. She wants to know why he's really doing all of this. He doesn't really have an answer, so naturally he starts yelling, mainly at you for just standing around and staring all the time without saying anything, which is kind of annoying. Seeing you all argue makes Magi start to understand the whole darkness thing. 
It reminds him of a legend of a Moogle named Mog who liked to dance, which doesn't sound like it has anything to do with the dark arts, but Moggy claims that it does. He says that Sid's master was right when he told him to submit to the flame to harness the abyss. Sid just never knew what he meant. Fortunately, Moggy will show you after you go and get him some palm work. While the two of you go out, Moggy wants Riel to stay and talk to him. When you return with the palm work, he gives you another task to kill some Tulahans because Moogles like to pawn off their chores on other people. Afterwards, he wants you to meet him in Asa. You do the job, but when you and Sid meet up in Asa, armed Moogles show up claiming that while you were distracted, they kidnapped Riel. Since they had so much fun playing together, they decided to keep her forever. And with their concealing magic, you'll never be able to find her. Sid jumps straight into his usual way of dealing with things. He takes out his sword and starts attacking while shouting out some colorful threats about how he's going to rip their palms off and choke them with them. After thoroughly beating up the Moogles, all but one who fell asleep because... Moogle. They ask Sid why does he even want her back since he doesn't seem to like having her around all that much. He says it's because he swore an oath and that's what Dark Knights do, but another Moogle counters claiming that flimsy reasons like that don't give you enough strength to protect anyone. If you really want to draw out your full power when fighting for someone, you have to actually care about them. Of course they deliver the message in the form of a song because Moogle, but the message has some merits. And no, I'm not singing it. I'm trying to gain subscribers, not run you guys off. Now that the fighting's over, Magi shows up with Riel who says that she knows the reason he and Frey helped her is because it's what their master would have done and he thinks it would make him stronger because the only thing he really cares about is killing Temple Knights. So he's not fighting for her and Frey didn't die for her. They were only doing what they thought was best for themselves. Sid admits that everything he's done has been for his parents, his master and himself. He apologizes for not being honest with her and he swears that after the trial, whatever happens in the future will be her decision, which is all she's been asking for since the beginning. With this little escapade out of the way, you head back to Ishgard with Sid cursing about the Moogles half the way and telling you why he hates the Temple Knights so much for the rest of the trip. He was about Riel's age when his family came to Ishgard looking for a better life. When the Temple Knights who they had fought and let live came back, they said they would show them mercy by letting them pick the order they died in. Sid watched his parents get killed, but when it was his turn, a man in black armor killed the knights and took him under his wing and trained him to defend the weak and punish the wicked. Now he realizes he used that mantra to get revenge on the knights and he mistreated Riel in the process. But he's all she has at the moment and he intends to defend her in this trial with his life. His streets sent for all of you to meet her in the western highlands away from the eyes of the people and proof that this certainly won't be a fair fight. But it doesn't matter. The three of you head out to face Riel's mother. The woman came with a small army of knights, but with you and Sid fighting and Riel healing, you cut them down until only a street is left. She can't understand why Sid fought so hard for the abomination, but in an act of mercy that you would have never expected to see from him, he offers to spare the woman if she leaves you alone. She refuses. She vows to hunt Riel down wherever she goes until she finally kills the girl, because the gods demand it. Accepting that her mother will never leave her alone, she gives Sid the go-ahead to finish her off, something he has no problem doing. True to his word, he defers to Riel to see what they do next, and she wants you all to go back to Ishgard together. Ironically enough, Sid realizes that the moment he let go of all of his rage and his desire for vengeance, he fully understood what his master had meant. He's learned how to unlock the power he wanted, and he's willing to use it to keep Riel safe, if she wants him to stick around. She does but only if he stops the silent Batman style brooding and talks to her more, something he agrees to do by grunting. In the meantime, while you have dealt with her mother, there may be others who know of her bloodline and may come hunting for her. If they do, Sid will be ready, and if things get too tough, he'll just give you a call. After dealing with Riel's crazy mother and returning to Ishgard, a lot changes in the city. The separation between the factions has faded for the most part, and with the Dragon Song War being over, things are looking up. However, Sadurgu always knows that there's always somebody doing something bad, no matter how good things look, and as Dark Knights, it's your job to keep all the criminals in check. But first you have to find them, so the two of you head out to patrol the city. As you pass Four Temps Manor, you can't help but to think about everything that brought you to this point, and all the people you failed to save along the way. Sid and Riel walk up, finding you lost in thought, just staring at the manor. 
Since they don't know about your odd history in Ishgard, you fill them in, but while you're talking, your soul crystal breaks in half. A strange young boy with long hair walks up claiming to be responsible. He calls himself Mist, although Sid doesn't believe him. Mist is a name given to orphans in the broom, but this boy looks like a young nobleman. To be honest, he looks like what you would get if Harshafon and his cell had a son. Mist claims to have a power that he wants to use to help people, but that power requires a lot of ether. He was trying to draw ether from nearby and accidentally drew some out of your soul crystal. He promises to give it back but first he wants to use it for a bit. The Warrior of Light isn't sure, and Sid just wants to stab the kid so you can get your ether back, but Riel is curious to find out who exactly he wants to help. He doesn't have a specific person in mind. The world is so full of sadness that if he can help anyone, that will make at least a small difference. Since he seems to be honest, Riel wants to help him find someone to help, but Sid, being the voice of reason, thinks helping the weird kid with the unknown power who stole your soul crystal's ether will probably cause you to have a bad day. But since it's your soul crystal, he leaves the decision up to you. And being the idiot that you are, you decide to help the boy as long as he agrees to fix your crystal once he's done. He promises that he will, so you all split up to find someone in need. You come across a woman named Millie who's having an argument with the carpenter who won't have his crew do any more work until they're paid, despite the woman's claims that the money is coming. It doesn't help that with the new regime in Ishgard, having a statue restored for a woman who is related to a former member of the Heaven's Ward is not a priority. While she doesn't know if her cousin was really a part of all the terrible things the Archbishop did, she does know that he had wanted the statue of Saint Valeroyant, a former Azure Dragoon who had forced Nidhogg back generations ago, restored after Dravanians destroyed it. It was his personal mission to have it repaired, but since his death, people don't want to get involved with the project. Since he was family, Millie plans on completing it for him, but without money, it's looking impossible, and now she doesn't know what to do. Not sure whether Miss Power can help her or not, since you don't even know what they do, you find him and let him know about the woman. He thinks he can help her, so you take him to her just so you can see what he can do. The first thing he asks her is if she wants to see her cousin again, which who wouldn't want to see a lost loved one again if someone offered. So Miss tells her to think of how he looked and sounded, then head off to a secluded spot and wait. To me, this sounds like a recipe for ending up with your photo on the back of a milk carton, but since she's curious, Millie agrees to wait for Mist in a secluded garden near the tribunal that both she and her cousin enjoyed. He sends you with her while he goes to get Sid and Riel so you all can see what he can do. When Mist shows up to the meeting spot, Millie is shocked to see that not only did he walk up with Sid and Riel, but her cousin as well. And since you killed him, he's a man that you know to be very, very dead. But he talks, acts, and even sounds very much alive. He comforts his cousin, however being a member of the Heavens Ward makes the city a little bit unsafe for him and Millie wants you to help him get out of the city. Sid agrees to help, but he wants you to meet him at Falcon's Nest because he has a lot that he wants to talk to you about. Mist warns that the further you get Ignace away from Millie, the weaker he'll get, so you need to be quick. You fully understand what he means when you see a swirling pool of dark ether replace the night. Mist lets you know that he can give memories form, but after a while the magic fades. Think of Amorod and the creature's image self recreating in the ancient city, and you have an idea of what the boy is doing but on a much, much smaller scale. What Emmett did seems to be permanent, Mist's memory clones are not. Once the spell is undone, the summoned memory turns back into ether, and since it's your ether, you reabsorb it. Now that you have your ether back, Sid snaps at Miss for doing something as stupid as summoning a member of the Heavens Ward in the middle of Ishgard. He could have gotten you all killed. And to make matters worse, the ether you absorbed wasn't all of what Miss took from you, so your soul crystal is still broken. He apologizes for lying, but he promises that if you help him four more times, you'll have all of your ether back. The minute this kid moved the goalposts, I probably would have stabbed him and taken my ether like that especially since he wants me to find the people for him to help then use my ether to do it. Sid chastises him for his half-baked attempts at being a hero, but Miss swears that's not what he's trying to do. He just wants to give some peace to all of those people whose lives have been shattered by tragedy. And since he does have the Warrior of Light's ether, she can't really let him out of her sight, so you have to tag along with him for at least a little while. Knowing that you'll help him makes him feel better, and Riel assures him that even though Sid acts like a jerk, he's gonna stick around too. Which is true, but Sid didn't want Riel ruining his tough guy image. 
Since you've made your decision, you all head back to Falcon's Nest to figure out what you're going to do next, while Sid complains about the fact that he's more of a babysitter now than a Dark Knight, a job that is driving him insane. Riel tries to find out more about the mysterious mist, but he won't say anything about himself and he doesn't seem to like anything other than conjuring people's memories, something that Sid has no idea how he does, and since he can't figure out how the boy is doing it, he can't think of a way to take back your ether other than completing the boy's task. Since there's no choice other than to get it done, you head out to Tailfeather to see if you can find someone who needs help there. While the hunters in the area haven't experienced any real tragedies of their own, a prisoner named Loudy has been brought to the area to atone for her crimes by doing hard labor, but the man in charge of her is extremely brutal, beating the woman constantly, and having dealt with Ishgardian justice before, what's happening to her may not be justified, so you all go to see for yourselves. It's not hard to find the woman, you just follow the sounds of a man yelling. The fact that the woman is on her knees groveling and begging for forgiveness as the man screams at her makes it all the worse. But you do recognize the woman, and had it not been for Emmerich's intervention, she would have been put to death for what she did. Seeing the way that the proctor treats her makes Sid want to kill him, until you let him know that the woman was the one who drugged you and led the protest that nearly led to the end of the peace with the Dravanians. However, the fact that you never took revenge on her for what she did to you makes what the proctor is doing seems even worse. The only reason she was against the treaty was because her husband had died fighting the Dravanians, and Miss wonders if letting her see her husband again will help her, but Sid thinks doing that will hurt the woman more. Even so, he's adamant about doing it anyway, so Sid agrees to help, however he won't have the boy summoning spirits in the middle of a crowd. He sends Riel and Mist into the woods while he frees the woman, since if you walk up to her with a giant sword, she might think you're there to kill her. The proctor is your target. If he's a good man, then give him a chance to ask for forgiveness for the way he treated his prisoner. If not, well, that's what the big sword is for. He is not sorry for what he did, so you bury him for his crimes and track down the others in time to see Laudy talking to the recreation of her husband. While she does talk to him, she knows that's not her husband and asks you to banish the thing. When she realizes that it was Miss that summoned it, she thanks him for what he tried to do and apologizes to you because she hated you for the simple reason that you fought the dragons and lived when her husband didn't. She heard stories of dark nights when she was little, and she wants you to keep fighting for people like her, but she doesn't want you to miss the time with your friends and family in between. To honor her husband, she decides to make the most of the freedom you gave her and leaves, letting you reclaim your ether. Mist feels terrible about the fact that he couldn't help her, but Sid tries to cheer him up by reminding him that he does have three more chances to get it right so he should stop whining and try again somewhere else. And while the vision of her husband didn't make her feel better, what you said to her did. Despite this, Mist is scared of failing again, so Sid comes up with an idea that you never expect to hear from him. He wants to take Mist to the Mughals, since they helped him and Riel when they weren't on the best of terms. Even though they're extremely annoying, Sid promises to refrain from ripping their palms off of their heads and making them eat them, and Mist is seemingly enjoying the sights. The place is almost pretty enough to make him forget the troubles of the world. Almost. But there is so much pain in the world and so much has been lost that even looking at the floating islands doesn't stop his guilt over not being able to help more people, and it's making him very bitter toward the world in general, something he's entirely too young to be. Apparently being alone with his thoughts wasn't helping to ease his conscience at all, so he decides to head back to Sid and Riel and continue his mission. Of course that makes Sid happy because he can get away from the Mughals, but Riel wants to show Mist around. The two of them run off before Sid can stop them. The two of you chase after the kids, only to have some Mughals make the mistake of sneaking up on Sid, who beats them all unconscious for making him lose sight of the children. The two of you split up, and you find them standing near the area where the Mughals had pretended to kidnap Riel and made the two of you beat them up a while back. Riel's in the process of telling Mist the story of how the Mughals sang to try and show Sid how he hadn't fully understood what his master was telling him to do on his path as a dark knight. She even tells him about how Sid lost his family and was raised by his master alongside Frey who died on him too. Sid was an angry guy back then and while Riel tries to say that he's gotten better, his desire to murder the Mughals and curse proves that uh, not so much. Since his master was so dear to him when Sid arrives, Mist offers to summon the man for him. Sid thinks about it then calls Mist a not so nice name before ordering him not to do it. He does it anyway, and Sid's master appears. 
He greets both you and Sid, and praises you for going so far as a Dark Knight on your own before you even met Sid, and he's proud of you both for bringing honor to the name of the Dark Knights, just like he had. He had once been a Temple Knight fighting Dravanians and leading men to their deaths again and again until the faces of his fallen allies all blended together. When the people became nothing more than bodies for him to throw at his enemies, he had left the Knights. It's a story Sid already knew, but what he didn't know was why his master had decided to become a Dark Knight and take on two children. It's a question Sid had asked before, and one that his master said he would understand when he was older and stronger. And since he asked the question again, his master decides to test him to see if he's strong enough to hear the answer. The master is no slouch, and he challenges you, Sid, and Riel all at once. Memory or not, the man is strong, but the three of you bring him down despite the fact that Sid took some serious wounds during the battle. However, the fact that he took the wounds to protect the two of you earns him some praise and the answer that he sought. The reason his master had taken on two kids was to leave behind a legacy that meant something. He had helped people to make up for the deaths he had caused, but training a new generation of protectors was a much better way to help fix the world, and he would train the new generation to be better than he was. With that, he prepares to fade away, but not before giving you a few words of wisdom. People who fight for others will never know peace. Every choice you make brings death for someone, be it one of your enemies, a friend, or even yourself. That isn't something you can avoid, you just have to learn to live with it. Lastly, he tells Sid to be a little nicer to Riel and a little less of a jerk in general. Then he's gone, and you retrieve more of your ether. While Sid is upset that Miss didn't listen to him, he wants the boy to use this as a learning experience. Memories can be painful, and summoning them without someone's consent could be bad. However, he's grateful for getting the chance to see his master and fight him again, but his injuries are serious, so Riel takes him back to Mog home. Seeing Sid actually heal emotionally after seeing his master makes Miss believe that there may be a little hope after all. However, I doubt his emotional healing will last since he's too weak to travel and has to stay with the Mughals. He even asks you to punch one of them for him just to make him feel better, something that I have no problem with doing because the Mughals are annoying. While Sid recovers, you and Miss continue your mission of helping random people, something the Warrior of Light should be very skilled at by now. This time he wants to find some people who have been hurt by war, so you head to Garabania, a place that has known a lot of battles. There you find a soldier who you had met forever ago in Quarry Mill. He needed some medicine and Mefred had ordered you to get some for him. Instead of taking it all himself, Galleon had given some to a friend who needed it. His friend made a full recovery. Galleon didn't. Unfortunately, his friend ended up working with the Griffin and dying at Belsar's Wall, a story I'll cover when I do a recap of Heaven's Ward. Despite his illness, Galleon outlived all of his friends, but now his disease has nearly claimed him and he's just sitting around waiting to die. Miss doesn't want to let a man who was willing to sacrifice his own life for a friend die so miserably alone, so he decides to summon Galleon's friend. The summoning works, and hearing his friend's voice, Galleon asks him to offer up a prayer for his fallen friends at the Reach, a request that Hodard is more than willing to honor. However, halfway there he shatters and returns to Aether. A man's memories can't outlive him, and it seems that Galleon died before his memory could complete the task. Mist doesn't take this well, and although he says he's going to head back to Ishgard, when you get to the Forgotten Knight, Sid and Riel haven't seen him, meaning you're going to have to track him down to get the last of your Aether back. Since the last place you saw him was in Raga's Reach, you, Riel, and Sid head back there to search for your Aether thief. One of the Resistance members had saw Miss wandering around saying forgive me over and over before running off, leaving behind a lot of dead chocobos that seemed to have had their life force sucked out. When you tell Sid what you found out, he lets you know that a boy matching Miss's description had been seen leaving the Reach and heading toward the Peaks, so that's your next destination. You pass more dead beasts that have no injuries on them, just like the chocobos in the Reach, which is strange since up until now Mist had only had one ability and he couldn't fight, at all, unless he was hiding other powers. And considering how he stole your ether when you first met, an ability he hadn't used since, there's no telling what else the boy was hiding. But Sid plans on finding out once you catch him, so the three of you split up to search faster. Sid and Riel track him down first and call out for you, but by the time you arrive, Riel is unconscious and Sid is down. Mist had attacked them, and whatever he had been drawing out of the creatures had made him a lot stronger. 
not to mention the fact that the memory he decided to summon was Riel's crazy mother. Still not knowing what the boy plans, you demand that he explain himself, but instead he says that you are just as much the cause of what he's doing as he is because of all the people you have killed and the lives you've ruined. Your body count is enormous, and the excuse you use, calling what you do justice, doesn't change the fact that you're a murderer. And while you aren't blameless, the entire world filled with cruelty and hate has made murderers out of so many people. But Mist has finally come up with a solution. Instead of trying to heal people one at a time, he's going to make the world a place free of death, where whenever someone falls, the will of their loved ones will summon them back as one of his illusions. But to do that, he'll have to consume massive amounts of ether to fill the world with his illusions, a plan that Sid thinks is insane despite the fact that he agrees that the world is a cruel place. Regardless, he won't stand by and let Mist force his illusions on people just to make himself feel better, and neither will you. Realizing that you can't accept what needs to be done, Miss sends countless visions of people you have killed after you, taking note of how you seem to slaughter everyone who stands in your way, yet you still lose everything you tried to protect in the process, leaving behind nothing but the pain of your loss and failures. Finally getting tired of this little game, the Warrior of Light closes her eyes and summons the one person who had said the things that she had always wanted to say but didn't, her darker half in the form of Frey. While yes, you do have a lot of sins, there aren't very many things that you truly regret. Frey tells Miss that a house divided cannot stand, and it's time for this pity party to end. Seeing his friend appear causes Sid to rightfully wonder what's going on, and in truth I think he is speaking for a lot of the audience, but that explanation will come soon. First Sid tosses his sword to Frey as Miss summons more of your fallen foes for you to face telling you that no matter how hard you fight, the day for you to pay for all of your sins will come. Something Frey says that he will welcome with open arms when it does, but that day's not today. Together the two of you bring down the apparitions, and Mist breaks down, begging for forgiveness, something Frey tells him that he shouldn't seek. You should carry the burdens of your deeds, it's part of what's owed to those who've died. And the people who have fallen deserve to live on, but only in your hearts and memories. Saying goodbye is always painful, but it is something that has to be done, which is why you have to enjoy the time you have with those you care about, because no matter how many regrets you have, you can't get that time back. The only person that you should seek forgiveness from is yourself, and with those words, both Frey and Miss vanish, returning to where they belong, inside of you. Now for some this story may be a bit confusing, so here's a brief explanation. Just like the manifestation of Frey was the warrior of light's darker half, the desire to say and do things that may have been frowned upon by others, Miss was the manifestation of your regrets, the guilt over the loss of so many friends and allies, and also your victims. The story was about the warrior of light's internal struggle with forgiving herself for all the things she's done and failed to do. That struggle just took place on the outside for everyone else to see. And yes, there's a very logical explanation for why you can summon these physical manifestations of your emotions and memories. One that we'll have to wait for another video. After facing down Sin Eaters and Light Wardens on the first, the Warrior of Light heads back to Ishgard just to make sure Sadurgu and Riel haven't gotten themselves into any trouble. Ironically enough, Sid has a letter for you, but before he gives it to you he wants to hear a bit about what you and the Scions have been getting into. The minute you start to mention other worlds and stuff, Sid is totally lost. To be fair, it is all pretty confusing, so he gets you to break it down for him, a lot like what I do on this channel. While the story is incredible, it doesn't really surprise him. He knew you were special in the first place. You had to be to become a Dark Knight, so nothing you accomplish will ever be unbelievable to him. The part of the story that interested him the most was Thancred and how he had to look after the reincarnation of his surrogate daughter. It's something he can relate to since he's doing the same thing for Riel. Hearing that he thinks of her as his daughter makes Riel extremely upset and she storms off after calling him a very colorful version of a chocobo's backside. Sid doesn't know why they made her so mad, but it's obvious that she has a crush on him. I wonder just how old Riel actually is. Because of the way Ellison grow, she might actually be about 20 years old. They basically hit puberty twice and the second time they grow like 3 feet and start to actually look like adults. Imagine being in college and still looking like a middle schooler. I guess that would be kind of frustrating. Sid decides to take this moment to give you the letter he had mentioned. It was delivered by a woman named Looney, but she wasn't the one who wrote it. If you want to know more, he tells you to go and find her because he has an angry girl to deal with. 
The letter is a very vague yet detailed thank you note, meaning it says a lot while saying absolutely nothing, leaving you with no clue who wrote it, so you go and see Looney to see if she knows more. She turns out to be the woman you saved from the Temple Knights when you first became a Dark Knight. She still remembers all the violent threats you made while scaring off all of the knights, and it makes her smile. I personally think it was the giant sword you were swinging around that caused them to run off, but the threats were an added bonus that apparently made the knights decide to never bother the woman again. While her life is great because of you, she wasn't the one who wrote the letter. A knight named Patronad had given it to her so she could give it to the hero of the Scions. He's at the congregation if you want to find out where he got the letter from. He didn't write it either. Orella of Raga's Reach gave it to him. He had spent some time there after the Battle of Gimlet Dark, and if you had to guess, whoever sent the letter to the Reach had heard of the fight between you and Zenos, and how you'd been brought to the Reach afterwards. But by the time the letter got there, you had already been moved to Ishgard. Looney had recognized your description, which is why he'd given the letter to her. He figured she'd see you before he did, and he was right. However, if you want to know more about the letter, you should ask Orella. That's a lot of traveling to find out who wrote a simple letter, but you're invested now so you head to the Reach. Orella tells you that the letter came with some supplies from Little Alamigo. She thinks the sender thought that if Lise would have seen the letter, she would have given it to you. But Lise didn't even notice it considering the fact that she was fighting a war at the time. This thing is getting a little ridiculous, but since you've gone this far, you head to Little Alamigo to hopefully find out who sent the letter. Gundabald, a man who you've known since the early days of your adventure and had agreed to send the letter because of how heartfelt it was. But since it's clearly bothering you to know who wrote the thing, he sends you to speak to a man named Godherd to get the answers. Godherd is someone else you've met before. He's the merchant who was angry at you for bringing his goods back covered in blood. He'd even tried to make you pay for the damages. After that day, he had made a lot of bad decisions that left him in debt to some people who took almost everything he had. When he had time to think, he realized just how wrong he had been to act like he had with you after you had helped him for free. He had decided to start a new life. He took some plants and became an apprentice to some botanist where he's proven himself to be quite good at the work. He just wanted to tell you how you changed his life and to thank you. As a gift, he gives you one of his flowers even though it's primarily used at funerals. And that makes you think back to Frey and how he was never given a proper send-off. So you decide to head to Curthus, the place where you talk to Frey the most, and wait for him to appear. Your darker half manifests after you leave the flower as an offering. In the beginning, you needed a voice to say all of the things that you couldn't, but now having come to terms with the complex person that you are, the Warrior of Light no longer defines herself by how other people see her. She no longer has to hide her anger and frustration or fears or grief for fear of how it'll affect those around her. What this little journey has done is shown her that there's no need to fear the darkness within herself because even that has the power to change someone's life for the better. This concludes the story of the Dark Knight, at least for now. If you enjoyed this video and my other content, hit the like button and subscribe. And if you really want to support me, become a member of the channel and buy me a coffee once a month. Until next time guys, later.